I would like to welcome everyone watching today's uh, TICEP Talks, uh, which is a seminar series that features researchers and practitioners on significant topics of sustainability in engineering, urban planning, and architecture. We have a large and diverse audience today, um, both from academia and industry. And I'm certain what brings us together is our awareness of the pressing need to take action on the Climate Change Act crisis, and also the importance of working together to find solutions. Today's seminar topic, decarbonizing the cement and concrete cycle, is an important and timely topic. The cement industry accounts for approximately 80% of the global greenhouse gas emissions, according to some estimates. And cement and concrete uh, count among the products that have the highest consumption per capita. I mean, you can just tell, right? Uh, it's, it's literally the backbone of uh, the typical urban environment today. We are very fortunate to have with us today, uh, Professor Eric Masanet who will present an overview of a number of emerging innovations in material science, carbon capture and utilization, and material sufficiency that can offer new pathways for decarbonizing the hard to abate source of emissions. Um, so before I introduce uh, Professor Masanet, a quick housekeeping note. After the presentation, we will have some time to answer questions from the viewers. Uh, so please free to enter your questions on the chat throughout the talk, and we'll take them up uh, during the question and answer period at the end of the presentation. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, today's speaker. Uh, Dr. Eric Masanet is a professor and Melichamp Chair in Sustainability Science for Emerging Technologies at the University of California at Santa Barbara. His research develops energy and material systems models to identify technology and policy pathways for decarbonizing industrial systems. From 2015 to 17, Professor Masanet led the Energy Demand Technology Unit at the International Energy Agency uh, in Paris. I guess it was a sabbatical for him uh, for a couple of years. Um, and there he oversaw. And lastly, I have to mention, I'd like to mention, it's a pleasure to welcome Eric back to Tyson after several years. Back in 2014, Eric had visited um, Tyson in person uh, to give a talk uh, and to conduct a workshop uh, on life cycle analysis techniques. So with that, I'll turn the screen over to Eric. Uh, thank you, Subhasis. Uh, I really appreciate the, the kind introduction and, and thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to reconnect with Tyson as, uh, as we just heard. I, I, I had the fortunate uh, experience to spend some time there uh, now several years ago and uh, I've been an admirer of all the great things happening. So it's a, it's a real honor to be able to present a seminar today. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and we can go ahead and get started. So um, let me just get the screen set up properly. Uh, so, so as Subhasi said, uh, I'm a professor at the University of California, uh, Santa Barbara. Uh, I'm also an adjunct professor at the McCormick School of Engineering at Northwestern University, where I spent about seven years before making a recent move to UCSB. And so the work I'll present today uh, was a collaboration between my, my lab uh, back at Northwestern and my new, new lab here at UCSB. And right off the bat, I want to acknowledge my, my outstanding research collaborators on this project. So we had an outstanding team of, of chemical engineering and, and, and science students who were analyzing all of the various ways that we can decarbonize the cement and concrete cycle. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge my, my, my collaborator, uh, Ji Chao, uh, a postdoc uh, in my lab, who's now an assistant professor at the University of Antwerp. Together, we, we released this recent report uh, funded by the Climate Works Foundation uh, just a few weeks ago. So it's now available and I'll be discussing uh, the motivations, the methods and the results uh, related to that report today. But I'd like to start with just a very high level overview. Um, so, so as Subasi said in the, in the introduction, uh, cement and concrete are a major 
contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and concrete is uh, the, the, the most consumed material on the planet. We see it around us every day, right? On our streets, in our buildings and so forth. If we add up all of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the entire cycle, which you're seeing here in this gray diagram, our estimates suggest it, it amounts to about three gigatons of, of CO2 equivalents. Most of us think, uh, when we think of the impacts of concrete, we think of cement manufacturing. And cement manufacturing accounts for the vast majority of emissions in the cycle, 2.4 gigatons. Uh, but there are other emissions that occur, other sources of emissions that occur along the cycle, including uh, when the concrete is, is poured uh, on the, the job site and, and the construction equipment, including concrete manufacturing, including aggregate production. And there's also a lot of transportation that occurs along the cycle, particularly between aggregates and cement manufacturing, but across the whole chain. And if we sum all that up, we get around three gigatons. And just to put that into perspective, that is around not quite 10%, but almost 10%, nine to 10% of, of global energy related CO2 emissions. So a single material system accounts for nearly 10% of all those emissions. So it's no surprise now that we have raised climate ambitions with, with the Paris Agreement. Uh, the ideal goal is to keep global warming to 1.5 degrees uh, or well below two at least. It's clear that we can't get to net zero emissions without decarbonizing the cement and concrete cycle. And I want to acknowledge that the industry, uh, particularly the cement industry, has made a lot of progress uh, over the last few decades. So what you're seeing here are reported uh, thermal efficiency values in, in a global database called Getting the Numbers Right. It's a database that contains uh, primary data, reported data from hundreds and hundreds of cement plants around the world. And what we can see is that the thermal efficiency of, of cement kilns uh, globally has improved quite substantially uh, over the last 30 years, uh, going from about 42, 43, 100 megajoules per ton of clinker to an average of around 3,500. So there have been significant efficiency gains uh, due to a lot of investments made by the industry. And there also have been a lot of strides made in using lower carbon fuels within the kilns. So what we see here is the mix of fuels, uh, green being fossil fuels, uh, blue being waste fuels, orange being biomass. We see a steady increase in the amount of low carbon fuels. And together, those thermal efficiency improvements and those, those low carbon fuel shifts over the last 30 years have significantly reduced the, the, the CO2 emissions per ton of clinker, uh, going from around 900 kilograms per ton of clinker down to around 800 kilograms uh, in, in roughly in the present day. So certainly some progress has been made. But if we think about where the industry needs to go, and frankly, where all industry needs to go in a net zero emissions future, it's clear that climate ambitions uh, need a significant acceleration. So what you're seeing here uh, are analysis uh, results from the, the latest energy technology perspectives report from the, the IEA. Uh, cement is highlighted in yellow here. What you're seeing is, are, are the trajectories for the, the, the stated policy scenario. This is the agency's outlook for, uh, or scenario, uh, where the world may be headed without increasing its climate ambitions. And the sustainable development scenario, which you see here, is the, the sustainable low carbon scenario. And what we see pretty clearly is that, uh, especially for the cement sector, which is, is shown here in yellow, uh, emissions must be drastically reduced by around mid-century out to 2070. So decarbonization of the cement and concrete cycle is critical. And again, there's really, uh, it's very difficult to imagine a path to net zero globally that doesn't involve significant and, and nearly full decarbonization uh, of the cement and concrete cycle. Uh, all the while, we need to decarbonize while the world will demand more cement. So uh, what we're seeing here is, is global cement production in 2019. China presently accounts for the vast majority of, of cement demand, cement production globally. But by 2050, uh, global demand is expected to increase uh, by around 30% to fuel infrastructure needs, to fuel development. And the, the, the uh, production uh, regionalization is expected to shift. So India currently accounts for, the, the, I think, the second uh, greatest amount of cement production. It looks quite small here in the present day compared to China. But by mid-century, India is emerging as a major producer of cement, Africa, developing Asia, and so forth. 
So not only do we need to decarbonize uh, the, the global cement and concrete cycle, but at the same time, we need to produce more cement potentially to meet the development needs of a growing population and provide uh, a decent living standards for all. So it, it is a tremendous challenge. And many decarbonization plans that you'll see for the, the cement sector particularly involve uh, quite a bit of carbon capture. It is a viable uh, technology. The world is investing in carbon capture. We, we, we already are seeing some projects focused on the, the cement sector. But if we take a step back and look at just how much CCS is required uh, in global decarbonization plans that have been published to date, we see that it, it, it's, it's pretty substantial. So what we see here on the left are results from the IEA's ETP 2017. The, the blue shaded uh, columns show the amount of, of, of CO2 that's captured in the beyond two degrees scenario. This is a scenario that gets the world uh, to net zero around 2060 and uh, hits a, a warming target of around 1.75 degrees Celsius. Uh, it's clear that lots and lots of CCS must be deployed. If we look at the, the red dots here, which, which show us the percent of total emissions that must be captured, uh, that's, that's around 80%. We quickly realized that uh, what this implies is that most of the world's cement plants will need to be equipped with CCS. Uh, and the world is working on this. But if we look at the, the historical deployment pace of CCS, what you're seeing here on the right-hand side are existing projects out to roughly 2020 uh, and inclusive of planned products and uh, planned CCS projects in the near term. So we have seen a three, three X growth in the amount of installed CCS capacity globally over the last 20 years. But if we look at where CCS needs to be in order to be on track for meeting the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets of the IEA's SDS, their sustainable development scenario, we see that in the next 10 years, we've got to increase CCS deployments by about 13 times and over the next 20 years by about 30 times. So that's an order of magnitude uh, acceleration in the pace of CCS deployment. Is it possible? Yes, but uh, in our work, what we tried to do was seek out alternative pathways to open up the option space for decarbonizing the cement and concrete cycle, to relieve some pressure on CCS, and to involve more stakeholders in the overall decarbonization process. So what I'll be presenting uh, a bit later in the, in, in the talk are some scenarios that, that we proposed for reaching net zero across the entire cement and concrete cycle uh, by mid-century, between 2050 and 2060. And no worries, uh, I will get into the details of these results after I introduce our methodology. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the innovation landscape that exists for decarbonizing this cycle. So there are numerous existing and emerging levers that, that the industry has. Uh, some of these are, are pretty conventional uh, and we know how to do them and many plants are doing them or have done them. So the first is improving the, the energy and efficiency of the cement kiln. Uh, kilns are, are very uh, energy, high energy consuming uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, their typical lifespans can be anywhere from 20 to 40 years. What I'm showing here on the right hand side is the historical uh, progress that the U.S. has made. So the U.S. is around the third largest, maybe now the fourth largest cement producer in the world. Uh, we now have an infrastructure bill that's being put before, before Congress. So. Uh, there could be more cement demand coming in the US uh, sh should we start reinvesting in, in our infrastructure. But the US's cement plants have, like, like the global average, made significant progress in both the efficiency of the kilns and also their adoption of low carbon fuels. But there still is bandwidth to improve the energy efficiency of our kiln stock. So that's generally one of the, the first recommendations is to upgrade and install new, more energy efficient kilns in existing plants. And when we build new plants, to install the most efficient preheater, precalciner kilns uh, right off the bat. Uh, there's also been a lot of progress by the industry in, in shifting to low carbon fuels. So low carbon fuels would include ideally biomass, which we in a perfect world could treat as mostly carbon neutral. And we see here a, a Lafarge plant in Ontario, which is firing its kilns using, using biomass. So there you see uh, bales of straw. Um, it is a viable energy source for cement kilns but it's difficult to run a cement kiln on 100% uh, biomass uh, due to energy den and density constraints uh, and, and also potential supply constraints. Uh, but we also have other low carbon fuels such as 
waste tires and other forms of waste that can reduce the, the carbon footprint of the fuel substantially. Another known lever, which is pursued in many parts of the world, is using less clinker in the overall cement that's produced by the plant. So clinker is the energy intensive uh, part of, of a mix of cement. And uh, in order to reduce the overall energy and carbon footprint of cement, we can use what are known as supplementary uh, cementitious materials that you see here in this graph. Fly ash, ground limestone, gypsum, blast furnace slag, and so forth. So here on the right, we see uh, getting the numbers right, reported data showing uh, an increase in the, uh, the use of, of SCMs and a decrease in the overall clinker to cement ratio. But if we look at sort of the technical potential, what is sort of a feasible lower limit, a practical lower limit, uh, it's around 60%. You can push that a little lower in, in some cases, but there's still significant bandwidth here. So when it comes to existing levers, there's still a lot of bandwidth left for tapping known solutions for reducing both the energy and the carbon intensity of producing cement. Uh, but those can only take us so far. Um, we also have to rely on a number of emerging levers. So uh, what do I mean by emerging? So I'm showing you here, and I'm sorry if it's a bit small on your screens, uh, a graph of what's known as the, the TRL, the technology readiness level. Uh, and this is a way that, that, that investors and analysts will, will, will give a technology a rating for its, its state of development. So TRL 9 means that the technology is, is essentially on the market, and a TRL of 1 means it's in the early conception, conceptualization stage. And there's, there's a whole range of development that occurs between those two levels. Um, and there's a lot of innovation happening these days on what's known as uh, low carbon and low energy cement chemistries. So on the right here, I'm showing you a graph which was uh, uh, borrowed from um, uh, Solidia, which is a commercial company producing uh, a Solidia blend of cement that uh, has less calcium oxide in the final mix. Why, why, why is that important? Well, it, it has two primary advantages. The first is that uh, with less calcium oxide, you have less of the calcining reaction to produce CO2 in the first place. So the reactions occurring in the kiln to produce the cement produce a lot less CO2. And it also lowers the, the stoichiometric energy requirements uh, for producing the clinker. And you also get a more energy efficient kiln. And there are numerous low carbon, low energy cement chemistries that are being developed to produce cement that just comes with less energy and carbon in the first place. But there's a range of development levels that are associated with the different chemistries. But that's one that's being pursued and is being adopted uh, with, with quite a lot of interest around the world. There's also a lot of, a lot of innovation occurring uh, on the kiln technologies. So uh, I would encourage everyone to take a look at Energy Technology Perspectives 2020. Uh, they have a, a dedicated chapter uh, or section on the cement industry where they review the innovation landscape uh, for the different technologies that are out there for cement. And what you're seeing here are some of the, the kiln technologies, direct electrification, uh, using concentrated solar power uh, for, for, for the kiln operations. Uh, they've also rated the TRL, and the key takeaway is while there is innovation occurring on the core kiln technologies, most of the innovations are still pretty early in the development cycle. They're not quite ready for market. Why that's important is we have a limited amount of time to, to stay within the 1.5 degree carbon budget. So it's really critical to accelerate the development and deployment of early stage technologies like these. There's also a lot of innovation, and I'm going to highlight this a bit later in the talk, around reducing the demand for concrete in the built environment in the first place. So if we don't need as much concrete or cement uh, moving forward, that's a big step forward to decarbonizing the industry. The best thing to do from at least the overall systems perspective is to avoid demand in the first place. And there's a lots, of, lots of innovation occurring here. Uh, one figure I like to use quite often comes from uh, out of Switzerland, ETH and EPFL. Uh, this is a picture of a, uh, floor panel, which just by looking at it, you can see it uses a lot less concrete than if we were to pour the floor uh, in, in an office building, for example. So potentially 50% less concrete if floor panels could be shifted to this precast design that's designed to be strong with, a, with an arch shape, uh, reducing the demand for concrete in the first place. There's also a lot of activity around, uh, and this is occurring very rapidly, it's very exciting, uh, around the use of, of, of cross-laminated or engineered timber for mid-rise and even, even high-rise type, type buildings. So by using advanced cross-laminated timber, 
we can substitute for concrete in the structure uh, and also potentially reduce the amount of concrete needed in foundations. So by shifting some buildings over to cross laminated timber, we can save concrete. Lastly, there's a lot of innovation occurring around carbon capture and utilization. So in our project, we consider two ways of using captured carbon for permanent sequestration in a way that produces useful materials for the built environment. One is the use of, of CO2 curing. So using captured CO2 and using that to cure the concrete as, as it cures, either in a precast uh, concrete plant or even on the job site. And there's a company, Carbon Cure, which is commercial, already has operations, which is using CO2 curing to sequester captured CO2. There are also companies that are taking captured CO2 and using it to mineralize, primarily industrial waste, but also there are some natural minerals. So take captured CO2, react it, and turn it into a rock, essentially. And we can use that rock in aggregate for new concrete. These technologies are, some are already in the market. Uh, some are very close, getting closer to, to market availability. So the good news is that there's a rich landscape of innovation out there to decarbonize this, this traditionally hard to abate sector. And so in the, in the project that I'm about to discuss now, uh, we wanted to take a look at all of those levers in a holistic uh, and interdependent way. We also wanted to produce a public use model, which we're calling Imagine Concrete. So Imagine Concrete is publicly available for advanced users. You can uh, go to our report, you can go to the GitHub link and download all the code. For uh, more, um, let's say, high level use of the model, we also have a web interface, which I'll introduce at the, at the end of the talk. But the key to understand here is that we modeled the entire life cycle of the concrete, uh, cement and concrete cycle, all the various steps um, in a cohesive uh, mass balance manner. We have a mass flow level so we can track all the flows of aggregates and cement and concrete into the built environments. What happens to it in the built environment and then after it's demolished, where does all that, that concrete go? We have an energy layer where we're tracking all of the various energy inputs into each unit process across the cycle. And we also have an emissions layer where we're tracking not only the, the positive emission fluxes from kiln reactions or fuel combustion, but also CO2 sequestration uh, through uh, either the use of, of, of carbon capture for sequestration or utilization and natural carbonation that occurs in concrete in the built environment. Uh, and we have roughly 30 technology levers, which we've included in the model that correspond to that innovation landscape I discussed earlier. Uh, and I apologize for, for the necessity to follow a bunch of codes here, but in the model, in the report, we, we coded each level, le lever, excuse me. So lever one has to do with a traditional cement plant technology options, kiln thermal energy improvements, improvements to milling grinding equipment, utilization of low carbon fuels. We included uh, six different low carbon uh, cement chemistries for which we could get data and understand their emissions and their energy requirements. We included uh, supplementary cementitious materials for clinker to cement ratio reductions where we could ensure that we were taking into account potential supply constraints. So as the world shifts away from coal-fired power plants, there'll be less fly ash for use as an SCM and so forth. Uh, we included two different types of, of at-plant carbon capture. We included a number of options for carbon utilization. So curing concrete with CO2, and then mineralization of, of captured CO2 into artificial aggregates using various types of industrial waste that we could also constrain in the model based on their availability. Uh, and finally, quite a few material efficiency strategies. So designing buildings in the first place to use less concrete, substituting concrete with potentially cross laminated timber, uh, you in, in, instituting lean construction practices on the job site extending the lifespan of buildings. These are all things that we can look at using this model. And then at the end of life, improve recycling of aggregate and even stockpiling demolition waste to let it take up more CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, underpinning the model though, uh, this is important to understand, is, is a really robust uh, mass flow and, and stock model. So we track uh, basically the flows of concrete through the built environment by understanding the end user demand uh, through drivers such as population growth, meter squared of living space per capita for different types of buildings, traffic for roadways. So using this dynamic material flow assessment framework, uh, we can track pretty, pretty well all the stocks of concrete 
in the built environment as a function of their materials intensities, of societal factors, and we can track when that concrete leaves the, the built environment at the, end of it, at the end of its life through lifespan assumption. So this gives us a nice, a nice way of looking at a lot of different scenarios for different demand pathways moving forward. Uh, and we can make projections of, of cement demand. So what you're seeing here are, are demand, cement demand projections that we made uh, for what we're calling our frozen or current ambition scenarios. I'll explain those in just a minute. So these aren't predictions of cement demand. Uh, what they are are scenario narratives so where, for where cement demand may be going under different societal demand conditions moving forward. So two important things to understand with these graphs uh, are number one, we, we focused on only a few of the cement demand sectors, but, but some of the larger ones, residential and non-residential buildings uh, and different types of roadways. Uh, and we also um, uh, used, uh, so sorry, that was the first caveat there. So when you look at the y-axis here, it doesn't encompass all the cement demand in China, the United States, or in India. It encompasses only the cement demand for the end uses, which we, we, we studied in this, this, this first report. We'll be adding more over time. The second thing you'll see is that we looked at three primary countries, China, the United States, and India. China is the world's largest producer, India is growing rapidly, and in the United States, we have a fairly saturated level of production, but we have a lot of infrastructure needs we want to address. Uh, and by using the, the dynamic stock flow model, we're able to understand how future demand uh, is a function of assumed building lifespans, population growth, uh, construction practices, and so forth. Um, another key feature of the model is that we took care to do very detailed accounting of all the various CO2 fluxes uh, and sinks that occur across the cycle within different scenarios. So this picture here shows our, our high level overview of the, the CO2 flows that we tracked. Again, positive fluxes and, and, and sort of negative sinks. So CO2 uptake in yellow, CO2 emissions in purple. We also had to take care for accounting for the CO2 implications of, of engineered timber and biomass utilization. So we get, we get CO2 uptake from, from CCS, from BECS in the model, uh, and from CCU, uh, including both CT, CO2 curing and CO2 mineralization. Uh, and we also have CO2 uh, uptake from cement carbonation occurring in the built environment. To model cement carbonation, uh, we took a very detailed approach where we wanted to understand the exposed areas of, of, of the concrete, uh, the atmosphere concentrations of, CO, uh, uh, of the surrounding environment and so forth. So I would encourage you to take a look at the report to really understand the details of the carbonation model, but it's important for understanding the net effects of the overall system. And we did so for both the built environment and also for demolished concrete. And critically, we accounted for car carbon storage and timber, trying not to take a simplistic approach where we just assume that carbon is sequestered forever in, in engineered wood, but rather tracking its life cycle so that we're accounting for how much carbon goes into the biomass, but then at the end of life, how much may be emitted through uh, decomposition in, in landfills or by burning that lumber for waste energy recovery. So all of this is tracked and what it gave us the opportunity to do was to have a very detailed accounting of all of the positive emission fluxes of CO2, which you see here uh, to the, uh, the, uh, the, the upper side uh, of the, the zero axis here on the Y axis. So these are all positive emission fluxes, but we're also able to capture CO2 uptake. And this is just one example scenario result. And the important thing is that all the results I'll show you refer to the net CO2 balance. Uh, so users of the model can specify whether they want to include carbonation or, or carbon stored in timber or not. And they can generate their own scenarios. If they just want to look at the carbon fluxes, which is the convention in a lot of existing road, roadmaps, that the positive fluxes, they can do so. If they want to consider the net balance between positive fluxes and CO2 uptake, they can choose to do that as well. But the scenarios I'll show you take into account the CO2 uptake uh, simulated in the model. So we've got to model it consistently across the life cycle to keep track of all fluxes and, and all, all uptake. So now I'm going to show you some results. So what we did in our report is we wanted to look at three different scenarios. Uh, and we had to do that, we had to create a fourth counterfactual. So our counterfactual is what we called the frozen scenario. And this 
This is only a counterfactual. What it does is it holds all technology progress in the cement and concrete cycle in the model static over time. And what it does is it gives us kind of a worst case view what would have happened if the industry wouldn't make efficiency improvements or adopt innovations. Clearly they are. So that's where, we, we, where the current ambition scenario comes in. And the difference between this, the frozen scenario, the counterfactual, and the current ambition scenario at the bottom of this line shows where the, the cycle may be headed based on the technology progress that's already being made based on announced policies. This, the current ambition scenario here uh, was designed to mirror the, the reference, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, the RTS, the reference technology scenario in the ETP's 2017 um, uh, set of scenarios. And what it tells us is that based on expected progress that the, the industry will make, uh, that'll help get the industry already to about a quarter of the reductions needed, even a bit more than a quarter of the reductions needed to get to net zero by mid-century. And you, to interpret the, the color bands here, know that these are the, the savings wedges associated with each one of the, 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 the broad levers, um, thermal efficiency improvements to kilns, low carbon fuel, fuel utilization, and so forth. So we looked at two different scenarios to illustrate the option space. One we called the production centric scenario. And this was meant to represent a scenario in which most of the onus for decarbonization rests with the cement and concrete industries. So there is no demand reduction in this scenario. What we're doing is we're looking at, do we have the technologies at the plants within the cycle to fully decarbonize? Uh, and the answer is yes, we do. And this isn't necessarily a new finding. Other plants, uh, plans have gotten to net zero. But what we're able to show is that some of the emerging technologies, low car lower carbon cement chemistries, use of concrete curing, use of mineralization, they can relieve some of the pressure that's being placed on CCS at plant and open up new opportunities for cement and concrete producers. So what you see here in the wedges, the gray, we've grayed out all the progress that's expected to be made, at least under our narratives, from frozen to current. And everything you see below that represents the increased ambitions, the new technology deployments that would have to occur to decarbonize the production side of the cement and concrete cycle. And on the right, you can see the, the cumulative uh, emissions reductions required from each of the levers. There's still quite a bit of dependence on CCS, well beyond current ambitions, but there's a lot of help now coming from some emerging technologies. So it gives us a way to identify innovations that need acceleration. And if we accelerate them, how much we, could we save? But we didn't want to limit our, our scenarios to only looking at uh, changing the production side, because we know that there's a lot of potential for material efficiency on the demand side. So just using material efficiency principles, leaner construction, material substitution, some of the, the tactics I discussed earlier to reduce the demand for concrete in the first place. And what we found was that, and I'm, I should have mentioned, I'm using China's building sector, which is the, the largest one we looked at in our report as an illustrative example. Here we can see that we were able to reduce dependency on CCS completely. So in the model we said, Let's say we want, we, want to, we want to avoid additional deployments of CCS beyond the, the, the level stated in the current ambitions. Could we get there through demand side changes? And if we could get there, what stakeholders would need to be at the table in order to realize these changes? And what we found was that there's a tremendous level of opportunity for using less concrete in the first place through leaner construction practices. You see the wedge here. Most of the savings we found were through material substitution, primarily cross laminated timber, replacing some of the concrete in the built environment with highly, highly engineered cross laminated uh, timber in mid and, and higher rise construction. Big wedge there, but we also found that there's room for improving fabrication yields, for extending the lifespan of buildings, and even some savings coming from better recycling and carbonation of, of demolished concrete. So the, the contrast between these two scenarios is quite stark. On the one side, we see if we focus on the production side, which has been kind of our traditional approach for approaching uh, many heavy industries, we can get to net zero uh, through a mix of technologies, primarily with a lot of reliance on CCS. But if we move to a more inclusive whole system scenario, where we also focus on demand reductions, uh, we can get to net zero without a reliance on CCS and by involving lots of new stakeholders. And I'll discuss that next. 
Uh, and, and there are a lot of commonalities we found between the different countries. There are uh, orders of magnitudes difference in the amount of savings between the US and China, and a factor of three or four difference between the savings in India and China, because China is the largest. But what we can see is there are different uh, levels of strategy that apply to the different countries based on their, their current building structures, uh, the types of structures that they currently use. In the US, we use lots and lots of lumber already. In China, that, that use is growing. Uh, we have different building lifespans uh, in the different countries. So while the general narrative is the same in the whole system scenario for the three different countries, the relative importance of different measures is a function of, of what's happening in those countries. But again, for all three countries, we found getting to net zero, even by around 2050, if we include CO2 uptake from carbonation and storage in, in mass timber, we can get there by, by mid-century. It, it is achievable. But what is it going to take? So we also did an analysis of the various stakeholders that would be required uh, in each scenario. So on the production side, what you're seeing here is, is kind of a radar chart showing where the savings are and which stakeholders really hold the keys to implementing those, those technologies to get the savings. And on the production side, no surprise, it's mostly in the hands of cement and concrete producers, R&D engineers, aggregate producers, clearly with the strong policy component as well, right? Policymakers can incentivize these technologies. They can help invest in CCS infrastructure and so forth. But if we look to the right side of the plot, there we see that the savings are, are much more evenly distributed uh, across all of the stakeholders in the cement and concrete cycle. So architects, construction engineers, uh, urban planners all play a big role in materials efficiency, in, in embracing uh, new ways of designing buildings and shifting to mass timber where they can and so forth. So the whole system scenario now not only opens up a lot of new levers uh, associated with, with new innovations on the demand side, but it involves a lot more stakeholders in the decarbonization process. And we argue that that's really important for accelerating the decarbonization of this cycle, because with the 1.5 C carbon budget, there's not a lot of time and we really need all hands on deck for decarbonization. So I'll wrap up here to talk a little bit about the, the, the barriers that exist. So an important caveat is that uh, this report and the model and these first analyses only consider the technical potential for emissions and energy savings uh, and also material savings from these innovations. We didn't look at the economics, which are critically important. Uh, that's an important next step for work like this. But we also want to acknowledge that there are lots of barriers and constraints that, that are associated with each one of the, the levers that I, that I discussed um, that also need to be addressed primarily through policymaking, but also through increased um, action by, by the stakeholders in the system. So when it comes to adopting the best available kilns, uh, some of the barriers are that kiln, cement kilns are very expensive technologies to put in place. Once they're in place, they tend to stick around for a while. Uh, they're not always easily retrofitted. So turning over the existing stock of kilns has to face uh, barriers of inertia, but also large capital investment barriers. Low carbon fuels pre present a, a fairly readily available decarbonization option for, for a lot of cement plants, but low carbon fuels are subject to local supply constraints and also energy dense density constraints. Clinker substitution uh, is a viable measure that's being used all around the world, but its level of adoption really can be hampered by uh, perceived risk, uh, local standards, supply constraints for SCMs, and then for some of the uh, more emerging technologies, CCS suffers from a lack of incentives. That's getting better, but uh, governments are now raising their ambitions, investing more in CCS, uh, but lack of incentives at the plant level without a carbon price, without strong tax incentives uh, for, adopting the C for adopting CCS at cement plants. And then the infrastructure for sequestration is also a big investment requirement. When it comes to low carbon cement chemistries, there's lots of need for more testing, more demonstrations to reduce perceived risk and to allow local or, or, or national building material standards or preferences among uh, end users to, to incorporate these chemistries into their, their, their specifications. And not every chemistry can be used in every end use of, of concrete. So the application space also needs to be widened over time. And then when it comes to you know, the importance, all important lever of demand reduction, uh, there are lots of, of, of barriers to overcome here primarily uh, having to do with getting architects, construction companies, 
to change their business models, change their habits, to specify less cement in concrete mixes where they can, but also to redesign the way they use concrete in the built environment to use less concrete in the first place. Uh, so what are our key findings? So I'm really pleased to announce that these that our models are publicly available. Uh, they've been they've been out there now for a couple of weeks, but this this seminar is hopefully going to get the word out a lot more 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 broadly. Um, and accurate modeling of this cycle is really an ongoing process. So in Imagine Concrete, we we feel like we captured more levers and more interdependencies than exist in, in models that are available in the public domain. But it's really important to consider a lot of factors how the buildings are designed, uh, what building codes are, what living standards are, how large dwellings are, where population growth is going, what local standards would imply for construction practices. Uh, but global uh, decarbonization of, of the cement and concrete cycle is, is possible. We're reinforcing that message with our report using technologies that already exist and those that are in the innovation pipeline. We can get there in a couple of different ways. We can get there in one extreme by focusing on the production side and deploying more energy efficient kilns and lots and lots of CCS in addition to, to other supply side measures. But we can also get there by involving many more stakeholders and involving more innovations by also considering the demand side. And this is the whole systems approach that we're advocating for in this, in this report. Uh, but Regardless of whether we pursue one extreme or the other, in reality, there's going to be a mix, and that mix may vary depending on local conditions. It's clear that we need accelerated development, demonstration, and deployment of a number of these innovations, and we need to reduce their cost and perceived risk in order for some of these scenarios to become a reality. And it'll involve all of the stakeholders that I mentioned. Uh, and lastly, I'll just say that there's a web-based version, like I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. We would welcome you to, 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 to test it out, to give us your feedback, where you can run various scenarios. The link is available in our public report. And if you go to the ClimateWorks website, you'll, to this URL, uh, you can see a nice article that they wrote about the report. But equally importantly, you can download the actual report, dive into the assumptions, get to know the model. And we'd love to hear from you with questions and, and, and comments if you're able to do so. Uh, and lastly, I want to give uh, a big thanks to the funder of this research, which was the Climate Works Foundation. It was really wonderful to work with them. So, so thank you to Climate Works. And now I'll, I'll stop and I'll, I'll open the floor to questions. Uh, I appreciate your attention. Chemistries come in. Their, their chemistry, their mineral composition leads to less CO2 being emitted in the chemical reactions. Okay, that's great. Um, we have another one here. Were you able to look into the effect of construction technologies like 3D printing of buildings and homes? Are there any potential reductions uh, possible there? Yes, it's a great question. So we didn't explicitly model uh, 3D printing uh, of, of homes. The lever that we included in the model for, for modeling innovations of that type had to do with the, the material intensity of a given building type and a given structure type. So there is a way to simulate that sort of change. Um, we did look in the literature for, for case studies data on the potential implications of using 3D printing. And at least what, what my impression was from the literature is it wasn't really clear. If you change the, the mix, uh, the, the cement and, and concrete mix that needs to go into providing the right fluidity and, and, and so forth to, to print a building. Uh, I've seen some studies that suggest uh, the, the, the concrete is a bit more carbon intensive for 3D printing. That said, the 3D printing process might be able to give us more novel shapes that use less concrete overall. And it's likely going to be a, a tension between those two, those two effects moving forward. So it was on our radar screen. We did provide a variable and a lever in the model for simulating what 3D printing could do. But as of now, we don't have it modeled explicitly. Uh, and, and data are appearing uh, in the literature over time that'll, that'll help us better understand the net effects of, of 3D printing on, on both material use and, and composition for construction. OK, so that's, that's interesting. Um, Another question here, are the major producers of concrete exporting the majority of their products to international markets 
or is it more domestic use? Uh, so in most countries, uh, so concrete uh, is generally made locally. Uh, so concrete is when we take cement and we mix it with aggregate and, and water and we create either the, the final precast product or, or we, we bring ready mix to the job site. Cement can be exported uh, and imported and really the, the amount of, of that, those, those flows depends on, on the economy and the production in any given year. So um, when I first started looking into the, the energy and emissions of cement and concrete, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago now, I was a researcher at LBL, and we were focusing our study on the state of California. And this was back during the California building boom. And in those days, around a third of the cement that California was consuming was coming from cement, uh, from China, sorry, if, if my memory serves me correctly. So, you know, you know, cement does move around the world and how much moves around is, is dependent on a lot of factors, but that's the major material that, that can be imported and exported. Concrete generally is made pretty close to the, the job site, especially if it's ready mix. Okay, so next one, if you're ready for it. Uh, it's pretty rapid fire. Um, what is the potential effect on CapEx and OPEX between production and demand initiatives? Yeah, it's, it's a really great question. I, I wish I had a, an answer to give. It's, it's something that we weren't able to include in our scope. Um, there are some, some studies out there that, that have cost data, CapEx data and, uh, and OPEX data for traditional measures like kiln efficiency improvements, efficient grinders, uh, low carbon fuels and so forth. Um, it is something that we'd like to do in, in our next phase of research is start considering the cost implications. One difficulty though on the demand side is it's, we, we, it's sometimes difficult to really put a cost number on, let's say um, the full range of cost benefits or, or cost drivers associated with choosing cross laminated timber over concrete. There we would need to have some idea of the overall you know, balance sheet for a building, but also there can be uh, sort of uh, knock-on benefits that come with adopting some of the demand side measures. So uh, if we're extending the, the lifespan of buildings, we may have to invest more concrete up front, but perhaps there, you know, there are more maintenance costs associated with, with that strategy because we're extending the building life. But if we're designing it well, there may be lower energy costs through improved insulation and so forth. So we're just starting to get an understanding of how to put sort of cost and benefit numbers on the demand side changes, but those changes are, are not well understood, at least from a cost perspective, but it is pretty, a pretty critical priority to start understanding now that we've, we've fleshed out some of the technical potential savings for energy and emissions, what does it mean for costs? Excellent, thanks. Um, so just to the audience, there's a number of comments coming in and then given the time that we have, um, I apologize, I won't be able to get to every one of them. So I have to pick and choose here. And um, I'm, I'm sure there'll be a way to uh, convey your uh, questions to Professor Masanet uh, if I don't get to them. But uh, here's the next one. Um, the material substitution lever, so regarding that, uh, specifically timber construction materials, are those materials assumed de facto carbon neutral or are there risks, or are there risks associated with long-term carbon cycling in forests factored into the model? Yeah, it's a, it's, that's a great question. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of scientific uncertainty in, in that overall carbon balance when we consider forestry and land use change. Uh, and what we did in our projects we, is we tried to rely on the best available numbers from the life cycle literature that was, that was focused on understanding those cycles. So we treated the CO2 uh, uptake in timber um, uh, as you know, storing carbon within the engineered wood um, you know, coming into a building. And the factors we use there, we've documented them in our report. I, I don't know them off the top of my head, but uh, if you follow up, I can, I can point you to them, where we try to use the, the best available science for, for just, you know, what is that overall balance, including forestry. And then we tracked the, the flow of that wood in, in our model, where it was in the built environment for whatever the, the lifespan assumption was. And then at the end of life, we made assumptions about 
what happened to the, the, the engineered timber? Was it landfilled and what fraction of, of, of landfill timber may maybe anaerobically decompose and produce methane over time? What fraction of landfills would have methane recovery? What fraction of that wood would potentially be combusted for energy recovery? And we accounted for all of those, those positive flows. Uh, and users can change assumptions in the model. That's one of the reasons we wanted to make it public is we've constructed scenarios that represent two paths, but there are many others. We've used what we think are the best assumptions from the literature and tried to justify them in the report, but users can change their assumptions. But that's the way we handle biogenic CO2 flows within our modeling framework. And it's, it's, it's an uncertain area for sure. Excellent. So we just got a minute left and I'll throw one last one at okay. you. Not from me, this is from the audience, uh, a member of the audience. There's a lot of technologies in TRL 3 to 6. So how do you consider that on the model to know the impact of the technologies in the long term? Yeah. The, in general, in the modeling community, um, we, we tend to associate with a, a TRL level with, with a future year of availability. Uh, in our model, we only looked at, uh, so the scenarios that I showed were focused primarily on TRL-9 or very close to TRL-9 type technologies. So we didn't look too far up or, or down, I should say, or early in the TRL process. So some of those innovative kilns that I mentioned, which you can read more about in the, the ETP 2020 report, uh, running on electrical resistance heating or, or hydrogen, those weren't modeled explicitly because we, they, were, they were too early for the scope of our scenarios. We wanted to show what's possible today or, or, or in the very near future with the innovations we have at hand. But in general, the way TRL levels and, and technology availability works in the modeling community is we have to make some assumption about the future year when that, that low TRL technology will become available. Uh, but for us, it was mostly technologies that were at the demonstration phase or already on the market in our scenarios. Excellent. Well, we are right at one o'clock, so I guess um, this concludes our time today. I'd like to thank Professor Masanid for taking the time um, to share this really important work, uh, you know, lots of uh, important insights here. Um, and I think I'm speaking for everyone when I say that we all uh, learned something new here. Uh, I hope we'll keep these conversations going and uh, will lead to nice collaborations uh, in the future. Um, uh, well, I want to mention to Professor Masan that there were lots of uh, congratulatory messages on the comment, on the chat comment, so which you may not have seen. And to conclude, uh, I'd really like to uh, thank the TISA team for organizing and hosting the seminar. And uh, thank you to all of you for attending. This was a great turnout uh, and a great discussion. So have a great day.